All right, so as Noam said, welcome. This is our uh, inaugural class of uh, a new series, um, bringing mindfulness home to the Dharma, back home to the Dharma. Uh, so my name is Tig. Uh, I'm a meditation teacher. I'm also a contemplative artist, so I weave meditation and creativity together. Um, I uh, am trained to teach secular programs called mindfulness-based stress reduction and cultivating emotional balance. Um, my journey with meditation and mindfulness started in grade school. Uh, I was actually part of our curriculum in the school that I went to. Um, so the seeds were kind of planted when I was young. And then as life unfolded and my career became stressful and um, you know, things like that. I started deepening my practice um, and uh, to the point where I decided I wanted to teach. Uh, I felt very called to kind of share the tools and practices that really helped me, uh, support me through life. Um, I had lived in a Tibetan Buddhist monastery in the Himalayas, so I have a background in Tibetan Dharma. Um, so I kind of straddle both secular uh, and, um, and Buddhist. Um, and as I mentioned before, I teach in hospitals and universities, which I'm going to talk a little bit about because we're, we're talking about uh, secular mindfulness. Um, so I teach um, in the NICUs. I help parents that are um, navigating the NICU experience with premature babies. And I also teach in a series of universities. So, and as Noam said, we're at the San Francisco Dharma Collective, Sangha Ranch, I love a feeling of community. Um, I love this umbrella for Dharma, so kind of this non-lineage Dharma center, um, which really allows for some innovative offerings to come forward, uh, yoga, and this class where we talk about secular mindfulness, and um, that wouldn't normally happen in a lineage Dharma center, so really loving the opportunity to kind of explore and, um, and bring Dharma to life in, in new and exciting ways. Um, as Noah mentioned, Donna is kind of uh, the support of this space and our community together. Um, so as much as you can give to keep the, uh, I don't say keep the air conditioning on, but <laughs> um, to help keep the center running uh, is much appreciated. Um, and I always love to think of the teachings and the opportunity to practice as a gift. And there is no money required for that. So Donna is not an exchange. You're not paying for a teaching. Um, it's more, uh, this is a gift that I'm giving freely, regardless of um, what finances come back. Um, any donna or donations is really to help support the teachers and the center. So exploring mindfulness, bringing it back to the Dharma. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, since this is the inaugural class, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, why we decided to make this offering and how it will kind of unfold. We'll have some time to practice um, and then have reflection and um, discussion time. So um, what's happened with mindfulness in our culture? Um, it's been, in many ways, it's been kind of pulled out of the system of Dharma. Um, and kind of is now existing in the world on its own. There are some programs, some that I actually teach, where the Dharma is woven into the secular nature. So you don't have to have a religious or spiritual background in order to practice, but the teachings are all kind of embedded in there. And so we shift words, like instead of suffering, we say stress. And instead of saying Buddhism, we say ancient wisdom. Uh, so I like to call that undercover dharma. Uh, and then there's also types of mindfulness out there where it's been, it's not even undercover dharma. It's been pulled away from even um, anything that looks like Buddhism. Um, and so um, there's this idea uh, that capitalism has kind of swayed mindfulness into this way of making people productive and goal-oriented and helps companies become more profitable. Um, so we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but the point is mindfulness has been pulled, kind of stretched away from the system that it was originally um, intended to sit with. 
Um, and there are some benefits to that. And so there's a, a universal accessibility. Um, people that might have religious trauma might, might not want to practice a religion. Um, it's, uh, it, it can be taught in public institutions. So I teach in hospitals and in public universities. If I was teaching Buddhism, I wouldn't be able to teach in those places. So it does help get the practice and, and the teachings out there um, in a broader way. Um, also, there's a lot to be said about this, uh, you know, the Dharma around for 25, 2600 years, our minds are different. Consciousness has evolved. Our lives are very different. And so um, secular mindfulness really helps address that. It looks at what are the most effective ways that mindfulness is taught and learned. So the pedagogy of how mindfulness is taught is very effective. Um, as I mentioned, I lived in a monastery in the Himalayas, incredible experience, but the way that it was being taught wasn't really for the Western mind. There was kind of an assumption that, um, you know, uh, that the examples that are used from the teachers aren't always relatable or relevant or modern. So um, the secular mindfulness kind of addresses some of that. And it's not just mindfulness. So the program that I teach, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, is mindfulness and undercover dharma, but there's also uh, stress psychology, stress resiliency, group dynamic, um, cognitive brain science, a lot. We're going to talk during the uh, unfolding of this offering, we're going to talk a lot about emotions, so emotion research, process of inquiry and journaling. So we really know how to teach it now in very effective ways. Um, not that we didn't before, but we know the most effective ways. And with that is the research aspect of it. So secular mindfulness has really opened the door to a lot of research being done over the past 40 years to understand exactly what's happening in the brain when we're practicing. Um, it can be done, you know, a lot of research with brain scans were done on the brains of monks. Um, but we don't know how they're learning. There isn't, it's not, uh, you know, one of the, the benefits of science is that the results can be repeated. So it's amazing that monks can hold their attention when really crazy things are happening around them during a brain scan, but can we teach people how to do that? And so uh, I think secular mindfulness really helps kind of uh, make sure that that platform is efficient and can be repeated over and over. And the last thing I wanted to say about kind of the benefits of secular mindfulness is that slowly it's becoming trauma informed. And so a lot of us bring uh, a lot of experience, whether it's uh, traumatic or otherwise into our sittings. And so when we have teachers that are forcing you to close your eyes and sit still, that can be very triggering for people that have had trauma. And so in secular mindfulness, um, we are really starting, I'm not saying that it's there all the way, but we're starting to address this. Um, so it's much more of an invitation. Maybe you want to focus here, maybe not. Maybe when we practice tonight, you'll want to work with the breath. Maybe that might be triggering for you and you want to switch to sounds. So there's a lot of permission in this kind of secular mindfulness where in some of the more traditional lineages, it's a little bit more um, not as sensitive to some of the um, wounds that we may be carrying. Now on the flip side of it, so what's tough about taking secular mindfulness out of the system? So obviously mindfulness for those of us that are Dharma practitioners, we know mindfulness is simply one part of a larger system. And so when we pull that one part away from the rest of the limbs, we're missing a big chunk of what the teachings are. Uh, so we, one of the big ones is the system of ethics. What are we using mindfulness for? And those of us that are familiar with the Dharma know that it is for the benefit of others, not just ourselves, but there's this ethic values and morals that come with it. There's this quote from Machi Ricard that says, uh, you know, you can be a mindful sharpshooter. You can be very focused and concentrated, but you can be using it to cause harm. And so one of the dangers of pulling mindfulness away from the entire system is that we lose sight of that. 
and I was reflecting today about that really demonstrates the power of the mind, you know, that we can, we can put these ripple effects out into the world. And if we have that power, we really need to watch what we're doing with it. And so I think that the Buddha knew that. I think he built this system of teachings around mindfulness, um, but it wasn't just about focus and concentration. It's not about being a hard worker. It's not about being more productive and more efficient. Those are outcomes of the practice, but they aren't the intention. Um, and so I think personally, I think that's very important that we keep that in mind. Um, so uh, I think the other thing that's kind of dangerous about the way that secular mindfulness is coming into the world is this idea about accessibility and privilege. So both Noam and I talked about how uh, at the Dharma Center, the Dharma Collective, we use dana um, to make sure that we can freely offer these teachings and practices. And so secular mindfulness is becoming a, a paywall, it's becoming a barrier. It's very rare that you would find access to secular mindfulness where it's free or donation-based. It's out there, um, but it's not the standard. And so as I kind of touched into it already, capitalism is starting to touch into a little bit of this very um, sacred practice, which um, I obviously I disagree with. I, you know, For me, I think about not just mindfulness, but all of these teachings and practices as like air that we breathe. That's how it's like medicine. And could you imagine charging someone to breathe air? And that's kind of how I feel about, you know, mindfulness. I understand people need to make their living, you know, right livelihood is something that we'll talk about uh, over the course of these offerings. Um, but it's just a concern, you know, how do we make the best of secular mindfulness really accessible to everyone? Um, I want to say that this is not to pit one against the other. This is not secular mindfulness against the Dharma, okay? I think that there's a lot where they can inform each other. I think they can support each other. They can learn from each other. Um, and sometimes in this class, I will use um, things from my secular training and mindfulness to help reinforce a point on Dharma and vice versa. So even though the name of the course is bringing mindfulness home to the Dharma, which is what we are doing, uh they kind of are they go hand in hand with each other um so i do believe that even you know the corporate uh the corporate like productivity initiative to bring mindfulness and teach mindfulness to the uh, employees i actually do think that's good because at least they're getting exposure that's their door into the dharma that's wonderful and we have seen that there are increases in Dharma centers when secular mindfulness is available in that area, more people are interested in going deeper and learning more. So I think make mindfulness is probably better than no mindfulness. <laughs> um, so uh, in this class, we'll really talk about how mindfulness is part of a greater system and the big emphasis on the ethics, uh, emotional balance, stress reduction, and, and also how we integrate mindfulness into life. So I think that's one of the other challenges that we have with traditional Dharma is like, how do we practice this in real life? Um, which I do think from my experience, both teaching and practicing the secular programs, they do a fantastic job uh, about how do we speak mindfully? Uh, how do we eat mindfully? How do we bring all of those um, elements into our life off the cushion, as we say? So for tonight, we're gonna kind of start at the basics. It's the inaugural class. So we're gonna just talk about the definition of mindfulness. What is mindfulness? And we'll look at the definition from a secular scientific uh, viewpoint, and then also um, from the sacred traditions um, that we're practicing here at the Dharma Collective. But before that, we're gonna take some time to practice. So um, before we answer the questions about what mindfulness is, we're gonna experience it. So we're going to make a transition. We're going to practice for about 25 minutes. So finding a posture that's comfortable. <clears throat> Maybe you'd like to close your eyes if that feels comfortable or perhaps keep them open and just soften the gaze. Maybe you'd like to lower 
your eyes down to the floor or surface in front of you. If closing the eyes doesn't feel comfortable right now. And just starting to make this transition from the outer world to noticing what's happening in the inner world and the energy that you're carrying into this practice. Just noticing the energy in the body. Taking a moment to notice the energy in the mind, the thoughts. mood, what are the energy, what's the energy of the emotions right now? And whatever you're finding here, welcoming. There's no right or wrong. There's no should or should not be this way. taking these moments of opening practice to check in and see what's here. And if it feels comfortable to come into the body in a deeper way, perhaps noticing the contact the body's making with the chair or cushion, just to help ground the awareness. Allow the attention to drop out of the thinking mind and down into the feeling body. Feeling that contact, maybe it's pressure or hardness. Maybe it's an awareness of gravity or the weight of the body. regardless of what's happening in the mind stream right now, we can use that sensation of contact just as a anchor, a steadiness, a stability. If you are in the body, perhaps now shifting up into the spinal column and awareness of how you're seated or laying down or standing, just coming into uh, alignment between the back, the neck, and the head. Maybe a very slight sense of lifting from the crown of the head up towards the ceiling. Coming into a dignified posture, one that allows you to be upright, alert, awake. And then balancing that with an invitation to bring ease through the body. Perhaps relaxing the muscles around the eyes, the jaw, the tongue. Down into the shoulders. Noticing any areas of tightness or tension. And maybe just by bringing your awareness, they release, maybe not. Checking at the abdomen, the pelvic floor, are soft and relax. All the way down into the legs and feet. So we're opening with these three aspects, grounded, vivid, and relaxed. So perhaps you'd like to use one or all three as your intention for this practice. How do you wish to meet each moment of whatever unfolds for the next 20 minutes? Maybe to keep your attention alert and vivid. Maybe to stay grounded in the body or relax in the mind. As we make a transition into the main part of this practice, I'd like to invite you to choose an anchor from your sensory experience that you'd like to pay attention to. So for some of us, that may be the sensation of breath. 
For others, it might be a sensation somewhere else in the body. Coming into the body is not feeling accessible right now. Maybe it's a sensation on the outside of the body in the way that the hands are resting in the lap or the feet are making contact with the ground. Maybe you'd like to listen during this practice using the sense of sound as your anchor to the present moment. We have a couple choices here. You can be with the breath, you can be with sensations in the body, or you can use this time as a listening practice. Whatever object of mindfulness you've chosen, starting to pour all of your awareness into that experience. And inviting a, a sense of being gentle, not forcing the attention on this anchor, not striving to hold the attention there, just gently experiencing a sense of curiosity and openness, whatever it is that you're noticing. It's the breath, maybe it's the rise and fall of the chest or abdomen, maybe a sensation of air moving in and out of the nostrils. You're with a sensation in the body, just noticing what that experience is like. Maybe there's a shape or a texture to the sensation, a color or a temperature. If you're listening to sound, just noticing the rise and fall of sound that arise and then disappear, or perhaps sounds that are more consistent and steady. It's like two streams of water flowing into one, all of your attention with all of that sensory experience. And inevitably, the mind will slip away from the object of mindfulness that you've chosen. <clears throat> Become aware of thoughts or sounds or other things happening in the room that you're in. Be thinking about the past or the future. And welcoming that. It's part of the present moment. We're not trying to stop things from happening here. Just being aware of how the mind is moving. And when you notice that it's no longer resting with that sensory object, you can choose, you have agency. You can come back to the present moment, you can come back to that sense whenever you're ready. The wandering mind is never a problem in this practice. In fact, it's the noticing and the return from when it wanders away, what we're practicing here.
know, we're seeing if there's a sense of evaluation or judgment of your practice or whatever's happening in your experience. Just noticing that that's what's happening in the mind stream. And when you're ready, you can return back to fully experiencing the sense that you've chosen to focus on. Remembering there's no right or wrong or good or bad in this practice. This balance of single pointed concentration and then returning when the mind slips away. Checking in to see where the attention is right now. Gathering up all of your awareness and returning back to the sensory object of your practice.
infusing your practice with a gentle awareness. The mind wanders, it's not a problem. And just by noticing that the mind slipped away, you're already back in the present moment. From here, we have the agency to let go of what it was that pulled us away. Take a moment to settle in and relax as we let go. And then choosing to return back to the object of your practice. can be said how we meet the wandering mind and our mindfulness practice is how we meet stress in life. So being gentle, paying attention to what you need, returning again and again to the present moment. For some of us, we may notice that the experience is shifting and changing. 
If you're with the breath, maybe it's slowing down. If you're with the sensation in the body, maybe it's becoming more subtle or more strong. If you're with sound, perhaps noticing the sound shifting. And just experiencing the present moment through this sensory object whether it's constant, steady, or ever-changing, being the observer of whatever is unfolding, that sense. At this point in the practice, you may be noticing a pattern of where the mind slips away to, perhaps a certain thought that keeps coming back, perhaps a general topic that the thoughts keep popping up. This is insight, noticing the way that the mind is moving. And then gently returning back to the present moment through the sensory anchor that you have chosen. Releasing your attention from that object of awareness, staying in the practice, but just for the final few moments, just rest in an open awareness, noticing what's here, coming forward in your awareness, any shifts or changes that have happened in the mind stream or the emotions or the body since we started this practice. And just letting the awareness rest, noticing thoughts, noticing sensations, noticing breath, sounds.
we come to an end of this practice together, let's take our time to make that transition back to an awareness of the outer world, taking the time to return back to open eyes if you haven't closed, perhaps making some gentle stretches or movements to help with that transition back to what's happening around you. So oftentimes in the sacred traditions, after a practice, we'll bow, bring our hands to our chest and bow. And it's really a sign of respect for the practice, for each other, this community that we're practicing with, honoring ourselves. One of the things that I love most about the bow in Buddhism is that we're bowing to our own enlightened mind. Love that. That is super healing for some of my religious trauma. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, before we move into the teaching, I want to just take a few minutes and hear uh, what that was like for you, or if there are any questions that came up. What did you notice in that practice? And since we're a small group, feel free uh, on Zoom, you can just speak or you can type it into the chat if you prefer. I'll share Tig, it's Mace. Um, I just, wow, I notice how distracted my mind is and then how quickly I come in like with a punishing sort of, I call it like my spiritual monitor, monitor like not good enough part, whatever. I don't know what it, but yeah. So I noticed that and how like just the, ur the urge of distraction. Did you say the urge of distraction? Yeah, like I practiced for a little while, just like feeling like this, like intense feeling in the front of my body of like opening my eyes, like checking to make sure there was no Zoom bomb or, you know, like just sort of like could feel the pull. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And did you feel a, when you were talking about your um, reaction to the mind wandering did you would the, that also have a sensation in the body accompanied with it, or was it more a cognitive base? That's a great question. Um, maybe a little bit of a like a t an intensity in like the forehead area above the eyebrows, but it was pretty. Um, yeah, maybe even some jaw clenching. With that, mm. that particular, you know, what are you doing? You're so distracted. Mm. But there was a lot of cognitive, there's a lot of thought that went with it too, like little me, 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 you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even though that's not pleasant, it's still part of the practice, you know. So just noticing that and returning back, that's the pathway to the present. So I appreciate you sharing that. And, um, you know, you know, you had mentioned about the clenching of the jaw, and I, I said it in one of the cues in the meditation, but it's always, there's this like really helpful idea that when the mind wanders, it's a chance to begin again. So in the beginning of that practice, we took some time to feel the body resting on the support. We uh, looked at our posture, we relaxed the body. Those are kind of like the opening, settling practices. So a lot of times in my own practice, when I do notice that my mind particularly will go far away, I use that as a moment to feel my body on the ground, check my posture, relax my jaw. Uh, and so as many times as that happens, as many times as we can come back with that gentle and ease. Thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> Okay, I'll describe my dilemma. Um, I I found what 
you were talking about uh, at the beginning, just really, really interesting. And it helped me really open up to, you know, the advantages of this and that. And uh, uh, very valuable. And then uh, when we start, I have, um, well, I have some sound processing issues. And uh, I find that I, I'm ultra sensitive to uh, people's voices. And uh, in, my, in my profession, I really learn to use my intuition and empathy to learn everything I could about uh, what was in people's voices. And, and so I, I find with just about all people leading these um, meditations that I start to once again lose myself, get, get focused on the timber, the meter, what, what uh, is likely going on. I do not imagine myself to relax. And that uh, what I found was at first, what I do to solve that is just move so that I can't really hear much of what's being said. So the sacrifice is I'm missing some instruction, but at the same time, I can uh, do what I do to get down into my body and uh, find what's needing to relax and Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And um, then, as what I find noticeably with your voice is that your your uh, meter and your timbre finally really uh, slowed down and softened. And I found that I could listen to you uh, at that point, and uh, and you were leaving a lot of silence, which I find is what I need. <laughs> so um, there's more to that, but that it's it's just a dilemma I'm finding with a lot uh, where I go two or three times a day to get uh, meditation, especially when someone's reading from a script. I find I just I just go. There's no way I can relax to this. And if it's a YouTube and they put in, there's no background music for me. They put in relaxing music. It's not for me. And so I, uh, I either, I, I, I come to just frame it as that that's how I am. I've been that way since I was a kid, you know, it's just really, um, uh, it just is, and uh, maybe there's not a problem. Maybe I've just found my ways to solve it, and that I don't, I miss out on some of the instruction. And then when I come back, and people go, Oh, that was the best meditation. I learned so much from what you were saying. And I'm like, Oh, oh, well. So I don't know. Any comment on that at all? <laughs> Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And can you tell me your name? I'm Patty O. Patty, I, uh, sorry, I can't see the name. It's a little far away from me. Yeah, uh, Patty, Patty O. Patty O, thank you for sharing that. Um, very vulnerable and real and authentic. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, what I want to comment first on, I love that you take care of yourself. If someone's voice is, and is, is not working for you, just mute it. <laughs> That's that's self care right there. That's self compassion, you know. So well done on that. I think a lot of the things that you were, you know, towards the end, you were commenting on, like, well, this is the way things are, and that's what mindfulness is, you know. Even though I have invited us to bring ease and relaxation into the body, that's not technically what mindfulness is. It's noticing when we might not be relaxed or noticing that this teacher's voice is really getting on my nerves or noticing like I'm very sensitive to sound, especially with the like the loud motorcycles that go down 24th street. 
and it triggers me. And so I, I just notice that when I'm with my breath or, or a sensation in my body and then a sound like that happens, I just, okay, <clears throat> for me, I need to open my eyes, make sure that I'm safe and that I can then restart my practice. And so there is a common belief that mindfulness is supposed to be pleasant. <laughs> and I'm here, to, I'm here to burst that bubble, right? That yeah. it is what it is. We notice if, you know, relaxation is the one thing that I would say in the beginning of a practice, if we can at least try to soften a little bit before we practice, that can be helpful. But as you heard me say in that, Maybe it won't, you know, maybe you're still squeezing or tensing somewhere, or we notice halfway through a practice, our jaw is clenching. That's just what's happening. And so mindfulness is being, well, I'm about to give away the whole definition of mindfulness, but <laughs> being with the present moment without trying to change it, you know, without judging it as wrong or bad. It's just what it is. It's a, there is a line of taking care of ourselves, of knowing, you know, we, we call it windows of threshold. When I hyper arouse uh, or hypo arouse, I start disassociating. And so knowing what we need to do to help ourselves through that, opening our eyes. For me, sometimes I just need to like feel my my hands on my knees to bring myself into another sense. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of what you are sharing is really wise and it sounds like you're really taking care of yourself. It just doesn't feel good. And so that's the practice. How do I be with this moment of unpleasantness and meet it with steadiness or whatever the intention is uh, to be gentle, to be grounded, to be awake and aware? Because as we all know, life will never be perfect and gentle and calm. There's always going to be the motorcycle or the annoying voice, right? And so if we're, my personal viewpoint is that if we're trying to get our meditation to a point where we're enlightened, and, you know, like, I, it's not realistic. I also like to say, like, we won't, we don't get, we don't become enlightened in the meditation practice. That's not where we see the benefit. It's more when things are really stressful outside of the practice that we're like, oh, I'm not responding the same way that I did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> Uh, I don't want to glorify the discomfort, but that's the practice. You're doing it. You know, that's the heavy lifting that's that's creating that the strong neural connections in the brain to be present no matter what's happening. So good noticing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> I had a, I'll share, I had an interesting experience that doesn't happen often in San Francisco. I was sweating. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed, you know, and I, I lived in India and Nepal and it's hot. And, you know, I did a lot of practice of just like following the sweat drop as it goes all the way down my face and down my shirt and stuff. And so then I was with my breath and then started noticing the sweat. I'm like, wow, this is so unusual for San Francisco. And then my mind started going to this is like what it was like in India. I'm like, oh, I'm nowhere near my breath, you know? So here we are. And I like to think of this, um, our senses as kind of like this symphony. There's so much happening. There's chatter in the mind, there's chatter outside. And um, I love this idea of like, you know, going to a crowded restaurant for a meal with a friend. And there's a lot of people talking all around you, you hear the noise but you're, folk, you're with your friend. To pay attention to your friend, you don't need everyone else to be quiet, right? You just need to have that intention to be present. And you know when you hear and you catch a little bit of someone's conversation and then you come back to your friend. And that's very similar to what we're doing here. It's just not some of those conversations that we might be hearing off to the side are not pleasant, um, like my mind, my, mind, my mind wandering. I saw a lot of nodding heads, so I'm assuming that that, that resonated with you all. Um, I actually, um, like I begin to perspire every time I meditate and I don't know what, um, I don't even have to be warm. Like I don't feel warm. Like my temperature doesn't feel like it's going up and I just start to like perspire on my forehead every single time. So I don't know what that is about. And then when I'm done, it goes away. So I didn't know anything about, about that. 
what my my question would be for you is how do you respond to that what comes up when you notice that um well a little bit of curiosity but then also but generally i start to i don't it's just uncomfortable and so then i start to focus on uh uh I, then I start to focus on the discomfort and the and the trying to stay with the meditation. So then it becomes like once I start like kind of perspiring, then it becomes more of like a chore. Uh, the meditation becomes like a like I have to get through this sort of thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I think that. Um, you know that's the practice we're noticing how the mind is responding to, is responding to what's happening so it's not really about the sweat or the perspiration it's it's more where your practice is pointing you is about how you're responding to it and for you know you've heard me use this example a lot about like the mind gym right so that's your that's your like 75 pound weight right? That it's giving you the resistance to the practice that you actually need. The mind wandering, if, if our minds didn't wander and we didn't get agitated in our practice, well, then we probably don't need to practice meditation. You know? <laughs> We've reached enlightenment, we're done. You all can teach the class. <laughs> so that's the resistance. That's what, you know, not saying that, again, we're not trying to glorify being uncomfortable, um, but even even when it is pleasant things like, oh, yeah, it's, I'm feeling good. My mind is focused. Well, if you're thinking that it's probably not very focused. But so my invitation to you would be, you know, noticing how the mind responds and then trying to be gentle with that. Uh, there's a million different things that we could talk about why that's happening. But in this practice, we're really looking at how are we responding to it? And sometimes it's just, oh, it's happening again back to the breath or whatever your your focus or your attention was that even though it's uncomfortable you are strengthening the neurological pathway in your brain to be present with it so that when something uncomfortable happens in life you have a pathway to uh, light up to help you navigate that so uh, again i don't want to glorify feeling uncomfortable but great noticing <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And, and noticing too, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know if, if you experience this, but with my forehead sweating, I was like, should I wipe my forehead? Like, <laughs> and like knowing, you know, I know if sweat gets in my eyes and the bottom of my contact, like, yeah, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wipe it. So it's like knowing, as we were talking about before with patio, like when, when do I need to be with it? And when do I need to change? When do I need to change posture? When do I need to wipe my brow? When do I need to open my eyes? That's also part of the practice. So really good, a really good workout for the mind there. All right. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the definition of mindfulness now that we practiced it. And then we'll have some time to reflect. So I'd love to hear what you all think. What is mindfulness? What, when you hear that, being, you hear that word, what do you think? Um, I heard a meditation teacher, or mindfulness teacher say once, um, attention with intention was mm -hmm. sort of the way he phrased it for us attention with intention i like that one what else do you think of? oh yeah think I would... oh go ahead go ahead patty no well let's do mace first we got a little cue i always think of the john cabot zen definition yeah right so like that's just like you know paying attention on purpose oh my god i just had it in my head um you know the whole thing i sure do um so the present moment paying attention to the present moment on purpose and then there's a second part it was seriously there but you'll <laughs> fill it in for us thanks and Dave. without judgment yeah great and patio 
Oh, what's the quote? Now I'm real curious. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a second. Oh, right? okay. Paying attention, paying attention uh, to the present moment on purpose. All right. I, uh, my goal when I, um, I started a meditation meeting after many years of 12 step study and then found, oh my God, I just need to jump in. So as I got more and more serious, it was, was to change the obsessional nature of my brain, the automatic reactions, the ability to um, have that self-inquiry enough to know when I'm grasping or running away from something and mm -hmm. to sit with, sit with a uh, compassion with what comes up. Because for me, um, you talked about e emotional stability. You didn't use the word equanimity, but I really like that, that concept that uh, I did not have um, emotional stability. And um, I, I'm finding that, that, that meditation practice is bringing that more and more and that um i'm healing these very uh traumatic memories that just plagued me over and over and over again they don't they don't keep flashing by and uh i knew that just talking about it did not help mm -hmm. i knew it it made it worse and listening to anybody else talk about their trauma made mine worse so i i'm finding that uh, the practice of sitting with the, the soft spots, the vulnerability, the sadness, the, uh, the fear in a, uh, with equanimity and compassion is what's really made the difference for me. So does that have to do anything with mindfulness? I guess it does, but who knows? That's my thing anyway. <laughs> well, that's, thank you for sharing that. And that's your practice. You know, that's what you're noticing as the kind of the fruits of your practice. So uh, definitely, you know, deep bows to that work that you've been doing. And um, let's, before I continue, let's hear from Noam you wanted to offer. Um, yeah, I, I, parts of what everyone said, I thought, oh, I have nothing to add. But then I realized I did, which is, I like to use the word presence. And, you know, it's it's something other, it's, yeah, it's being in the present, but it's something else. I'm not sh quite sure what it is, something about showing up. And then the other part of it for me is that it's embodied, like I'm connected to my whole body, not just my mind. Mm. Thank you. I love that there's everyone expressed it differently, but kind of saying the same thing, you know, that there's this presence. We heard the word intention, non-judgment, compassion, equanimity, embodiment. So it's not just about the presence. It's also about how we're being present, how we're noticing. Um, and what I heard coming through too, is that there are slight differences between this idea that like mindful, being mindful is being aware and mindfulness is the practice of being aware. And so what I love is that each of you were kind of sharing some variation on that. Um, and so we hear a lot of times people say, oh, you know, I was walking mindfully. Like, well, were you walking with awareness or were you practicing being aware? They are two different things, um, very, very similar but because of the intention, I'm choosing to be here. And when the mind wanders from my walking, I'm coming back, that's mindfulness walking. Um, so yes, what everyone shared, you know, that's kind of, when I think about mindfulness, I think about the John Kabat-Zinn statement, which I'm gonna talk about in a second, um, paying attention to the present moment on purpose and without judgment. And so we're gonna talk about this one for a second. This is kind of the, I don't know if gold standard is really the right word, but co common, commonly agreed upon statement, uh, understanding of what mindfulness is. It's what's being measured. I think that's a big part of 
secular mindfulness is that things can be measured. Um, so breaking that statement down, um, paying attention. So noticing, attending to, being with um, the present moment now. So in a lot of times uh, we use in, in the formal mindfulness practices, we use our senses. So touch, how we're feeling, interoception, feeling from the inside, sound, you can even do a smell, taste. Uh, those are happening now. If you're paying attention to a sensory experience, it's happening right now. You're in the present moment um, and on purpose. So we're setting an intention to be here. Uh, we set an intention that when the mind wanders, we'll come back. We set an intention to be relaxed as we pay attention. Maybe not relaxed in the body, but relaxed in the awareness. Um, there's a lot of times in life that we are paying attention to the present moment, driving a car, uh, working, playing an instrument, cooking. But did we set the intention to do it purposefully, to be there fully for it? And when the mind gets distracted, we just gently come back to what it is that we're doing. We very rarely set an intention before we get in the car to be present. <laughs> Maybe we should, <laughs> uh, but um, you know that is one of the, the key things, the intention um, of the practice. And then without judgment, and I think this is the biggest one in all the years that I've been teaching secular mindfulness, it's the without judgment piece that is really tough. You know, of like, oh, the mind wandering is bad, or this practice is, is not good. I shouldn't, my, I shouldn't be having these thoughts. And what I love about this without judgment statement is the permission for the present moment to be exactly as it is without needing to change it. Uh, so a lot of times I like to think uh, less about stopping the judgment and more about noticing the judgment. Because without judgment, you know, I think you probably heard me say this before. It's like, get your magic wand out and let mm -hmm. me magically stop judging everything. Like, that's just, you know, we actually need it in some ways but we don't need to be so um, defined by it. We don't need to let our judgments rule us. Um, and so when we put all that together for a mindfulness practice, attending to, paying attention to what's happening now on purpose and without getting too caught up in the right or wrong about what's happening and just being with it. If we are judging our practice, that we're just strengthening those pathways for us to judge everything that's happening around us in life um discernment versus judgment is a whole other teaching but uh in terms of this practice uh that that definition is kind of where the secular camp is uh with that definition so on the sacred side on the dharma side on the overt dharma side so much fun to be able to teach like this <laughs> It translates from Pali. The word in Pali means to remember. Um, I've also heard to bear in mind, um, to recall. And also another phrase that I've heard is to not float away are some of the literal translations. And uh, what are we remembering? So remembering to come back, remembering that we're practicing, remembering the teachings that the mind mindfulness is part of remembering who we are, remembering our Buddha nature, remembering that we are whole and complete exactly as we are, even if it doesn't feel like that. Um, and so, but mostly it's about remembering to be present. Uh, so I wanna read this quote um, who is from Nina Van Gorkum, who's a Buddhist scholar and a translator. Um, she translates Pali, uh, which is the language that the Buddha taught um, into English. She says, there are many opportunities for generosity, for morality, and for mental development, but, when we are, but we are often forgetful and we waste such opportunities. When mindfulness arises, the opportunities are no longer wasted. There has to be mindfulness with generosity, morality, and calmness, and with the development of insight. So um, for those of you that aren't familiar, you know, just it's really quickly. Time for Kiwi to go to. The generosity. Uh, so 
giving the gift of our attention, being generous with our presence, um, that we are practicing for others, uh, this morality. We're going to talk a lot about this as this offering unfolds about the ethical system that mindfulness supports um, to not cause harm, to be restrained in our reactions to things, to respond skillfully, um, the calm abiding, so the peace that's, that is available to us, even when there can be the biggest storm, the biggest frustrations, the sweat dripping, the motorcycles outside, the, the self-deprecating talk about our practice, we can still be calm. There's a difference between calm abiding and being relaxed and, and at peace, you know, so we can have that steadiness even when things are tough. So what I really like about the, the more Dharma definition is that it's not so much about remembering something that happened in the past, it's remembering to be here. And that's where the magic happens. That's where generosity and morality and calmness can happen. So it's being attentive to the present rather than um, this uh, memory and this faculty of memory um, regarding the past. So when we say to remember, it's not like we're trying to remember something from, from what happened 20 minutes ago. It's that we're actually being present. This is the tricky thing with a lot of the translations from Pali and Sanskrit is that the English word don't really, you know, to remember doesn't really um, get there. However, I think that, you know, on the Dharma side, it's more the definition of mindfulness is that it's a mental faculty. It's the ability to be present. It's a quality of the mind. And on the secular side, it describes the practice um, how do we integrate that presence into our life? Um, so setting an intention, being with our sensory experience, trying not to judge or noticing when we are. And so in a way, those two things are kind of the same, two very different ways of describing the same thing. Um, I think the secular focus is more about the practice and the integration into life. And the Dharma definition is more about the the faculty of mind, the ability of our mind to access these things like generosity and ethics um, and taking care of ourselves and each other when we're being present. We'll just let that sink in for a second. Not floating away. <laughs> so, um, I would love to hear what you think about that. What comes up for you? What questions do you have? What really resonates? What's not clear about those definitions? I have a question. I, oh, oh go, go ahead, David. Um, I forgot my question. Oh, the, um, the non-judgmental aspect of um, mindfulness, was that, um, that wasn't like part of really the Buddha's teachings on mindfulness. Like it wasn't on the Dharma side of things, right? Non-judgment is in the traditional teachings, it's called non-judgment. So it is an attitude of the practice. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a there's a whole list of these attitudes, which actually are part of the secular tradition too. But this non-judgment, non-striving, patience, accepting, letting go, these are qualities of how we practice. Uh, so uh, I don't know what the translations yeah, like for those words are in Pali, but yeah, being being with being with the present moment without trying to change it. Uh, I think, you know, as uh, as we go further in this exploration of this kind of secular sacred mindfulness idea, um, we'll be talking a lot about the, the noble truths and the four noble truths. And so a lot of suffering, the teachings are that suffering arises from our attachments and our aversions. But where do our attachments and aversions come from? Our judgments. Right. So he didn't, the Buddha didn't teach, didn't use the words not judgment, 
but he did teach that suffering is ultimately coming from our assessment of what's pleasant and unpleasant and how we react to that. Great question. Um, yeah, something that I think was new to me was this, I, it was the emphasis on intention. Yeah. And uh, you were talking about it from the secular perspective primarily, but it really uh, took me to uh, one of my favorite Buddhist teachers, Thich Nhat Hanh, who has, uh, I forget what they're called, but there's sort of like things to say while you're doing things so that you're present, so that you're mindful. Um, I, I think it's because you talked about driving your car he has they're kind of like mantras but they're not really you know and and so when you get in your car you say i'm in my car i'm driving my car when the car goes fast i go fast and i'd never thought of that as you know you can get in your car and and be mindful or be present or or notice be aware but that you're doing it intentionally so it just made me think that that was Kind of what he was getting at with those little statements and and now that you've articulated that and kind of are, are pondering this how does that relate to your practice well um it really is uh the case that throughout the day you know now that i've been practicing for some number of years i will notice whether i'm really present or not and i will bring myself back you know so there is that intentionality of it which kind of makes me wonder if i really am ever present if i'm not intentional about it but i guess you get into these moments when you're you know really focused mm -hmm. but are you really present i don't know well and it sounds like then you're operating on this with the intention to be present yes right yes and that's the beautiful thing about intentions because you know for for one of the practice the intention could be to be relaxed it could be to uh to, to just be present <laughs> that, that's as simple as that you know i taught a class this morning on intention setting <laughs> And we were talking a lot about how, um, you know, the difference between a goal and an intention is that a goal, they're both things that we aim for, but a goal is measured and it's followed up on and it's evaluated, whereas an intention is not. So it's impossible to judge. If you're judging your intention, then it's a goal, right? So what I love about this idea is that it's, it's, pointing us in the direction. It's like, we know where we wanna go. We wanna stay present with our practice. So let me turn and face that direction by setting that intention. Otherwise, if we don't set the intention, it's like, we're, I wanna go over here, but I'm actually looking this way. Mm -hmm. The intention kind of like, I like to think about the, the vibration of an intention points us in the direction that we wanna go. And then we take off. Uh, monitoring where we are, our progress, that's all goal, those are all goal oriented things, which are helpful, um, can be helpful and can also be very destructive, i.e. capitalism. <laughs> um, but yes, thank you for sharing that. I think that's uh, very insightful. So I'm curious is that after kind of hearing some of that, the secular definition, the, the Dharma definition, um, what does that, how does that show up for your practice? Is that sway how you practice at all <clears throat> what does mindfulness practice mean for you now Well, um, I, I do wish to expand being present and aware more and more in my life. And um, now that I realize that, yeah, it, my, my being present just comes and goes like it does when I'm sitting down to meditate, then uh, I'm still practicing Dharma. 
<laughs> it's not like I uh, failed to enter the exclusive Buddha club or something. It's just been uh, that uh, sometimes I fail to be present and I, I am more present more and more as I practice and have a formal sit down two, three times a day and, and studying Dharma. It just does keep expanding on its own. So it's not like I, I have a wish for it. It was not a goal. Uh, I do want to say though about car, the car, I, uh, I got so, um, when the lid came off of uh, everything that had been suppressed around uh, early childhood issues, I no, I no longer worked, so I no longer had something that sucked all my attention and energy. And I was literally going into psychotic breaks. And uh, I, I had road rage so bad that I made up a road rage meditation because it was just getting worse and worse and worse. And I'd make myself stay in the right lane. And it was really something. And, and I was driving the other day and I went, oh, I don't have to do that anymore. It's just uh, whatever it was that needed to get accomplished did. And so I don't know what the goal was other than to not trigger into that state because it was carrying into just outrageous rages uh, that were scaring me and scaring others too. So uh, there it is. It just, you know, in spite of all my 12 step efforts to get my rage to go down, it just went away. So there it is. Mm. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I love, you know, when, when you, at one point you, you said, it's just the way it is. It's just, this just what's happening. You know, like the wisdom to be able to just like hold that and, and say, okay, this isn't pleasant, but it's just what's happening. Uh, I mean, that's, that's being, that's uh, attending to the present moment without judging it. Like it doesn't feel good, but that's what's here. And the other thing I love is that with the, you know, when you were just describing at the very end about the, the road rage is that it was for the benefit of yourself and others. And this is one of the, the, the topics right now about in secular mindfulness is that, that ethics, you know, that this, we are practicing for the good of others. Um, and that's one of the things that, you know, I personally love about the Dharma. It's not about the self-improvement. It's not being the best TIG that I can be. The best TIG that I can be is one that would be in service to other people and myself. Um, and so, you know, thank you for illustrating that point because in your practice um, that you are now seeing the benefit, the ripple effect of your practice and how that, how that, that impacts other people around you. And that's really what, you know, I love thinking about like the Dharma, the teachings and the practices, the energy of the Dharma. It's like this ripple, uh, you know, we hear we can't, the, the Dharma wheel spinning and it's like, there's this energy coming off of when we think, when we act, when we feel um, in alignment with the Dharma, that it affects other people in a positive way. And this is the alleviation of suffering. So thank you for illustrating that. I feel like we could probably talk for a lot longer, but we need to wrap up. Uh, anything, I know we didn't, everyone get to share anything burning that you want to share before we end? Okay, smiles all around. Um, okay, so something I also don't get to do very often in the secular classes that will end with a dedication. So perhaps you'd like to close your eyes or just soften the gaze just for these final few minutes together in community, in support of the Sangha, and just taking these final moments together to reflect on this past hour and a half, hearing about this new class, practicing mindfulness together, exploring the 
two sides of the same coin at the definition of mindfulness. And then we dedicate this energy to the aspiration of attaining enlightenment, of reducing stress, finding emotional balance for ourselves so that we can be the greatest benefit to those around us. May the energy of this practice and our time together ripple out into the world, touching every being that it comes in contact with, inspiring them to live with presence, with an open mind and an open heart. And may learning about and practicing mindfulness together support us on our path towards the alleviation of suffering for ourselves and for all beings. Perhaps there is an intention you'd like to set moving forward from this practice. Perhaps an attitude you'd like to embody as you move into the night, the day tomorrow. And if it feels comfortable, perhaps bowing your head as a gesture of respect for the teachings, for each other, for your own mind. And then as you're ready, releasing that short practice of dedication, transitioning back to open eyes if you have them closed. So thank you for spending the time with me tonight. Appreciate you being here on the, on the uh, inaugural run of the class. I hope to see you next month. So we'll be doing this every Tuesday night, uh, every first Tuesday of each month. Um, I'll also be teaching a mandala meditation workshop. So as I mentioned, I'm a uh, contemplative artist. So I'll be teaching a workshop on the 18th, which is a Saturday afternoon. It's on the website if you're interested in learning more of how we can use mandalas as meditation. Um, but hope to see you next month. And thanks again. Bye-bye. <laughs>